Welcome everyone. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy and the host of today's BizHack Live digital marketing masterclass series on Web3 and the metaverse. I'm thrilled to be here. Last week, many of you joined us for how brands are rewriting the rules of marketing in the metaverse. If you missed it, it's on the Starmark and BizHack YouTube channels. Also, as a thank you for coming today, you'll get a link to it. Today, you're gonna, we're gonna explore the financial and legal implications of Web3 for business with the amazing Brett Malinowski and Kim Pryor. We'll introduce them briefly in, in a second. Next week, same time, 12.30 on Wednesday, we're gonna be with Angela Anthony, the founder and CEO of Scoutable, talking about how to engage employees and recruit talent using the metaverse. Brett Searcy, who's the producer of this series, is actually going to take front stage for that and talk about the incredibly innovative ways that he is engaging his team members in Metaverse town hall meetings um, to increase their engagement and also to help them serve their clients better. Definitely don't want to miss it. And then in two weeks from today, we're going to have case studies of how businesses uh, are using Web3 in the Metaverse with Morehouse College. Uh, Dr. Musina Morris built an entire virtual campus for Morehouse College, and it's been going for two years now, absolutely on the cutting edge, got a grant from Meta to do it, definitely don't want to miss hearing from her, and Tommy Farr, who's the founder of the Metaverse Hospitality Consulting Group. We know by virtue of us all living in Miami, a lot of us uh, are in the hospitality industry, and Tommy is going to talk to us about cutting edge applications in the, uh, of Web3 and the Metaverse in that industry. I am the host of today. My background is nearly 20 years in journalism. I worked at PBS and NPR, so a lot of broadcast, as well as the Miami Herald, Washington Post. I was lucky enough to be a part of a Pulitzer Prize. I have brought my skills as a presenter and as a host uh, into the business storytelling world, aka marketing. Uh, I've worked as a marketer for some big companies, and now I am uh, the founder of a fractional. CMO service provider. What the heck is a fractional CMO service provider? Stick around at the end of today's session. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work we're doing with one of our clients uh, who is a uh, selling, it's basically they want to become the Amazon of celebrity NFTs. We're going to explain what that means. And Brett, and, uh, Brett Malinowski and I are going to chat a little bit uh, about some of the fun applications with the client that we're working with. That'll be a little bonus tacked on to today's session. I want to introduce to the stage the amazing Brett Searcy, uh, Chief Digital Officer of Starmark. Brett. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. Great. And you want to introduce yourself real quick, or would you prefer I do it? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, been a technologist for, for many, many years, starting with e-commerce in 95. Um, I've uh, also spun off a few startups and technology companies. I've got a couple of patents, authored some books, uh, direct the innovation lab uh, here at Starmark, where we get to play with all the cool new tech and stuff and apply it to our clients' marketing and advertising needs. Awesome. Yeah, they're one of the most, I've, I've been aware of Starmark for years, asked Brett to partner with me on this because they've been at the cutting edge uh, of technology forever. Um, and, you know, always sort of pushing the envelope. I actually was lucky enough to go and join them at their offices and they have um, cameras that follow you as you walk around. They have a little <laughs> robot camera that can be like a Zoom face. Like, you know, like when you're watching the Olympics and they all, all the people with their faces in the stands, that's what he does for meetings. Um, really kind of pushing the envelope of what's possible for his clients. And uh, he has been the subject matter expert uh, bringing folks like him and Brett uh, Malinowski uh, to the fold. And I'm, I'm just very grateful to you and, and just the quality, integrity uh, of everything that you do. Um, I did want to um, acknowledge uh, Danilo Vargas uh, the, uh, from the Office of Equity and Inclusion of the Miami-Dade Mayor. It happens that it's Daniela Levine Cava's birthday today. Happy birthday, Mayor. And so <laughs> Danilo is actually at a birthday party right now, uh, but he did want me to send his uh, regards, uh, if any of you have ever crossed paths with Danilo, throw it in the chat, send a quick happy birthday uh, to the mayor if you like. Uh, we're very grateful. The mayor actually has funded this series. 
uh, as part of their commitment and dedication to equity and inclusion uh, for small businesses. And we're, we're very grateful to be the recipient of, of that funding and, and to have the Office of the Mayor's support in these efforts. We also are lucky enough uh, to have uh, the Miami-Dade uh, uh, Bar Association as one of our uh, sponsors for today's. Um, I actually, um, you'll see there's an attendee named Brett Berlin with one T, Tiffany, if you could please promote him uh, to a panelist. Uh, I'd like Brett to be able to say a word about the Miami-Dade Bar. It's Florida's oldest bar association and it's Florida's largest bar association. And um, we uh, are focused on legal issues. You know, Kim uh, Pryor is a Miami based uh, lawyer. And so um, I just wanted to give 30 seconds to Brett, uh, a dear friend. Um, uh, he has completely re re remade and rejuvenated a, a century old institution. And I, I just wanted to invite you to, to say a few words. Um, you're on mute, by the way. There, we're proud to be a part of this program and we'll continue to support everything that uh, that you and BizHack is doing for the community. We are not just an organization of lawyers, but are focused on community service and are here to partner with any of you if you have some ideas where you think some lawyers would be appropriate. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thank you. And feel free to throw into the chat, um, you know, any information you want about how to learn more about the work you guys do and, and, and the benefits of membership. I also wanted to acknowledge our media partner, South Florida PBS. Uh, I have a background of working at PBS. In fact, I worked at a show based out of WPBT uh, here in North Miami. Uh, very grateful for their partnership. And these are two of the more than two dozen community partners, uh, chambers of commerce, foundations, American Marketing Association that have helped promote this product to their members and we're so grateful uh, for your uh, partnership. Now let's get to the fun stuff. I wanted to start by welcoming Brett Malinowski, an NFT entrepreneur, young enough to be my son, uh, <laughs> established himself as a pioneer within Web3. How can we talk about the metaverse and Web3 and the next cutting edge uh, of, of digital technology and not have a a, a young person uh, in the mix. And um, this, is, this is not just any young person, uh, more than 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, um, brings incredible expertise and integrity uh, to the work. Um, we know that this is a fraught space with lots of scams and fraudsters. Brett Malinowski is a guy to follow. He is gonna give you good, reliable, trustworthy information. And it's going to be, as you'll see, he's also a ton of fun. He's got a lot of fun examples that he can share. Um, uh, Kim Pryor uh, is the co-author of one of the very first textbooks worldwide on blockchain and Web3 law. And um, it's a very emergent field uh, of law. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot that we still don't know. Um, and Kim is going to help guide us on what is known, what's not, what's in debate. And she's also, I hope, going to throw a little bit of cold water on the conversation. Uh, your role today, Kim, is to be the lawyer who's lawyering these crazy ideas that we're going to talk to you about, because there are a lot of, I would call them like, uh, almost like landmines, legal landmines in this space. And you could very easily have massive tax implications on seemingly innocuous decisions. And so as a business owner, you, you need to understand the, the reward and the, and the opportunity, but also the risk. And so, so Kim, uh, she's gonna be our, um, our lawyer in the room today as we talk through some, some really uh, exciting opportunities. Kim, it, it would be very boring if we just had you lecture on us to yeah. us about law. So what I would re prefer we do is really have you respond to a lot of the examples that Brett, uh, the Bretts are going to be bringing up. Uh, and and as, as such, you, you will naturally start talking about the state of the law. Um, but, you know, we, we want you to 
um, temper our over enthusiasm and give us all the right warnings and caveats that every business owner, every CEO needs in order to actually successfully uh, foray into this space. The bottom line, guys, is this is the future. This is web three, web one, the internet, web two, social media, this is web three. It's happening already. It's further along than you realize. Business is already making tons of money in it. Entrepreneurs like Brett, who are you know barely old enough to drive a car uh, or, or vote, uh, are now uh, hugely six. I'm kidding, Brett. I'm going to give you. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, I, we, I like it. All right. We we talk about diversity and inclusion, and part of that is you know giving youth voices a space to talk, and so we we love having you here. Uh, and I will give you shit the entire time. Excuse my <laughs> language. Um, what can you expect from us? You can expect a recording of this session will be shared uh, with you and a link to our YouTube channels for BizHack and Starmark. At the end of the four sessions, we're going to compile all of the best practices into a summary so that you basically will have a checklist uh, of to-dos. Um, so don't feel like you need to take a ton of notes. You're on the, er by the, the very fact that you're here today means you're in the early end of web, web three and metaverse adoption. So wait until the end of this, take the checklist and just follow it. Don't feel like you need to get started right away. We'll compile all the best information from four hours of guests uh, into a very usable document. You'll also be automatically be enrolled in the two upcoming ma masterclass sessions, but we still, we, this is an incredible service, incredible high quality guests. You know, I have an NPR and PBS pedigree, please share this. Think of two people who you think would benefit from this. Tiffany's going to throw the link into the chat. Today's webinar is the financial and legal implications uh, of Web3 for business. We have no assumptions here of knowledge. And so I'm going to start as we always do with uh, Brett Searcy, who's going to give us a little bit of definition around what Web3, Metaverse, NFT, and blockchain mean. Thanks, Dan. So just a quick uh, background. Um, when we say Web3, what we're trying to say is like the 3.0, the third version of what the internet is or may become. Web1 was more about the development of websites. Web2, everybody considers to be social media. And then Web3 is kind of taking what is the next version going to be? And it's a little bit more about, say, yeah. owner ownership of your own information and your own content, your own data, your personal self. Um, in the in the world of social media, the so the this information is owned by the big conglomerates like a Meta, not by yourself. And that's kind of a, a brief definition of that. And so uh, there's another a uh, couple other uh, important components to Web three. Um, you've probably heard about the blockchain. So the, you know, just like Facebook has a huge database of your data, the blockchain is kind of similar to a, a public database that anybody can log information to, and therefore. It can be audited by anyone and anyone can view it. Um, but it's also written in a way that it's uh, considered immutable, uh, which means it, it cannot be edited. And that's what makes it valuable. Um, crypto coins started as a proof of concept to prove that this blockchain immutable ledger could work. That was Bitcoin. It did prove that out to be true. Um, and then other things started being added to this uh, immutable ledger. Um, and uh, things like... Uh, NFTs or non-fungible tokens. And basically it started out with crypto art and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then it's then you start to get into um, what are the problems that what are the problems out there that this can solve for? And there are a lot. And that's the exciting thing about what's happening um, with the blockchain and with NFTs and what what else can be uh, utilized to help you know fuel the growth of web3. So, you know, the metaverse is an idea that's not new. It was described in quite vivid detail in a book, a science fiction book in the early 90s called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. Uh, I'm reading it. I totally encourage you to pick it up because it's insanely accurate to what has emerged in Roblox and Fortnite and all the games that your kids are playing, they are actively engaged in a metaverse. The, the metaverse is not just Oculus. It's not just these 3D goggles. Um, the, the marketing primarily is happening inside of the metaverse, 
but it's part of a larger revolution called Web3 that's built on uh, a foundational technology called blockchain, which allows for the radical decentralization of ownership. And so Web1, right, is kind of more similar, like nobody owns the internet, but Web2, most of the, the big activity is on the big platforms owned by LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. And, and that's the big difference between Web2 and Web3 is there's at least the possibility and the hope for a very non-corporate, more communally owned space, more similar to what Web1 looked like. But there's a lot of fighting going on right now. And there's a very good opportunity or chance that it will go. The question is still open. Will we go more in the Web1 decentralized? Um, you know, because in part that was a government developed product, or are we going to go in the web two direction where it's primarily social media is owned by private companies? So, um, Brett, I want to, Brett, seriously, I want to bring you back just really quick. Um, I, I wanted to share um, a couple of um, examples, uh, sorry, uh, there we go, uh, of three live examples of um, what an NFT kind of looks like in the wild. Uh, and then we're gonna lead right into uh, an example from Brett, that's Re Brett Malinowski, that's more kind of cutting edge usage use cases. We, we've gone very quickly in our adoption cycle from experiments to pretty broad adoption. And we're gonna, and Brett, the CRC is gonna walk us through that evolution. Yeah, and, and I think Brett M can also uh, certainly uh, chime in on these. He's very familiar with these. So. Um, uh, NFTs have been around for a while, but I think that uh, the example we're showing here is um, called Every Days, and it's by an artist known as Beeple. And it's the first uh, NFT that like sold for like millions of dollars and really brought NFTs into the public consciousness or the public eye to, to say what the heck is an NFT and why is this important. Um, and I think there's a really good relationship between you know, art and NFTs. And uh, from a foundational perspective, basically every piece of art in the world has a provenance. And that provenance just simply says, who created the art? When was it created? Who bought it? Who sold it? Who bought it? Who sold it? Who bought it? Who sold it? And some of this art that's hundreds and hundreds of years old has a very long provenance, right? And that provenance is basically proof or evidence that it's not a forgery and that it's legit. And an NFT is, is again, written to an immutable ledger, proof or evidence that it's, it's legit. And I think that that's why art is like the first place where NFTs really flourished and became popular is because of that perfect, you know, match or relationship. Um, Brett, do you have anything you want to add or comment on, on, on where it started? Yeah, I mean, this was really the NFT heard around the world. This was sold for over $60 million and really is what kicked off and sparked the art world's renaissance in the NFT space. Artists have been traditionally, you know, very suppressed and very hard for them to monetize their, their skill that takes so long to build. And usually they don't even see the benefit until after they die. And so we saw a huge flood of digital artists come into the space. And that's what all the rave was this last year at the NFT space. And it all started with this one right here with people. Awesome. So this is an example that we actually had from last session that people loved. So uh, Brett Searcy, you want to uh, tee this one up? Yeah, just quickly. And then I want Brett to talk about it too. But um, so, um, you know, if you think about art that can be uh, purchased as an NFT, when we talk about the metaverse and these virtual places like Fortnite or Roblox or, or Meta Horizons World, you have these avatars, these virtual representations of yourselves. And what is the first thing people want to do is they want them to look cool. <laughs> so a lot of fashion brands have gotten in the space where you can buy jackets and hats. And of course, uh, these are called crypto kicks. They're, they're made by Artifact for Nike. And you can purchase these and, as NFTs. And there, there's a limited uh, run of these shoes, just like they have limited runs of their special shoes. And you can deck out your avatar with them, but then you know you can buy and sell them um, as well if once you're done uh, using those. This is really cool for me. And since you hinted at my age, Dan, I'm gonna go at this a little bit. So I was one of the first people, our generation was the first generation to have internet our whole life through school. And so I grew up with the Fortnites, with these video games. And in high school or in middle school, your status was you in these video games. And 
you would buy these in-game items for $20, $30. So you'd have to get your mom's credit card and you would try to make your character look as cool as possible and it'd be like the talk of the town in school. And so to see Artifact, which is one of the earliest NFT companies, actually get acquired by Nike for over a billion dollars. Nike paid a billion dollars to acquire this Web3 company, then actually come in and just go all in on digital wearables for the metaverse and for these games is super exciting because they're also now tying these digital wearables to physical redemption. And so if you actually own these NFTs, you get airdropped these actual digital sneakers. And then whenever they line up their season drop, you can actually go to their website, connect your wallet, claim your NFT, and they'll ship you the real pair of shoes as well. And so this is a really cool blend of one of the biggest companies with one of the biggest NFT projects coming together to just bring this to life. And it's one of the most exciting things and my favorite part about NFTs for sure. That's awesome. And there's a question in the chat about how much do these cost? If you look on the screenshot, it says 0.54 ethereum which is approximately 850 dollars uh for for one of these now the price can change and fluctuate but that's just where it was when we took the screenshot and yeah, basically man. nike is treating its virtual shoes right these are these are crypto kicks that can only exist in the metaverse right you can you know those of you who are like familiar with roblox or or Fortnite, your avatar can get dressed and you can pay for fashion inside of there. And that's what these are. These are virtual shoes that cost $850 in the resale market. So, so Nike put these on sale. They were uniquely tied, if I'm not mistaken, with an NFT. So each pair is unique, but then that NFT, that shoe, right? It, that object that is an NFT can then get resold in a uh, different, marketplaces, the largest of which is OpenSea. And so there's the original value. Any idea, Brett, what the original cost was of these shoes? Okay, so this was actually airdropped to holders of the original uh, collection called the Clone X Murakami uh, drop. And basically those go for around ten to $15,000 right now. So you had to have one of those to be able to claim one of these. And Got so it. So it was free. almost like a little freebie add-on and then exactly. some of the then monetizing the giveaway by reselling it on OpenSea. Yeah, so you're really injecting value into that main collection at the very start by giving these people exclusive drops, and these are going to be really rare. So you know how sneaker flipping goes these days. These sneakers will be only one of 10,000. You could probably sell these for a healthy profit if you want yeah. to. And could you just explain what a drop is for people who've never, who are new to the world? Yeah, so it's just an NFT collection. And the NFT collection is like their Genesis collection, meaning like their first collection. If you hold this, you're gonna get all the benefits, kind of like a loyalty rewards program. And basically every single three months, just like a new fashion line comes out, they do a new drop of new digital wearables and you can basically customize them or they're gonna give you a random one. Great. Um, I'm throwing in the link, I'm dropping <laughs> the link of <laughs> Nike's acquisition of the metaverse company. Uh, if you guys wanna see, uh, what a $1 billion acquisition looks like in this space. Again, this is not theory, guys. This is actual $1 billion non-Ethereum dollars <laughs> on a metaverse company. This isn't, you know, invention. This is happening today, real and now. Um, before we go to the next example, uh, I want to bring Kim Pryor in. Kim, pour cold water on us. What do you got? <laughs> well, this is, I mean, this is an example of something that doesn't, really raise a ton of legal issues because this is, you know, Nike who owns, you know, we, we look at NFTs from a couple of different areas, right? The first is probably like intellectual property is the most obvious because you have to figure out who owns the rights to, you know, whatever um, trademarks there are or, or whatever the actual asset is, who owns the rights to that? So Nike is the one that owns the the trademarks. They, they own the intellectual property for their their brand. So the fact that Nike issued this, you know, pretty much we can be, you know, pretty comfortable that there's no IP issues here. Um, now, if I were to like make a copy of this and then start to promote it or do my own NFT, then I'm infringing on Nike's IP rights and that's a big problem. So that's one angle to look at it from. The other angle that we as lawyers like look at this from it would be, um, the securities laws or, or any of the financial um, regu regulations. So the securities laws are like the, the one that we look to first usually. Again, if you're not fractionalizing your 
ownership of an NFT, meaning it's not me and 20 people raising money to buy one pair of sneakers, and then we go resell it on the market, and then we divide the profits, that is starting to look a little bit more like a security or, you know, an investment in a common enterprise, which is what we're, we look for from a security aspect. If I can prior- you really quick, yeah, just- yeah. Could you define what a security is? Uh, it's like a company broken into pieces called stocks, right? Is yeah, so that's that's security. one example. The, the security definition in the securities laws probably has like 50 different items that can be considered securities. One is like a stock or a bond, which is really common that we all know. Or, you know, if you have your own LLC or, or partnership, you know, you have, you know, interest in that. Those, those are securities. Um, what the SEC uses in the digital asset space, they use this very broad term called an investment contract. And, and that um, they analyze that using this test um, from the 1950s called the Howey test, uh, which has a few prongs to it, an investment of money in a common enterprise that's um, where you're expecting profits based on the efforts of others or third parties. So that that's what we uh, lawyers use to analyze all of these different digital assets to determine whether or not we have securities problems or not. Um, and and so this is an example that doesn't give me much heartburn from the security side. Um, you know, you have where you run into like tax. Don't, don't, tax don't, 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 it's, it's not time for the cold water yet. You'll get a chance. I yeah, no cold water yet. So we can move on and I can, uh, yeah. Go Nike. Spend a million bucks. Yeah, go Nike. They're, they're good. <laughs> All right. Next is DraftKings. Brett Searcy. Yeah, so this is again just another I think example that is you know easy to relate to, but they're making you know trading cards. And everyone's familiar with trading cards, they've been around 100 years, right? The idea with trading cards is that the the market drives the value, the the you can sell uh you know, you can tell how uh rare like if the, in a, in, a, in the traditional world they might have a very small print run or a very large print run do the same exact thing with the NFTs. You can tell exactly how many they've printed or minted in this case. And then things like Tom Brady might be worth more because people have more value in Tom Brady. And it's an open market for trading cards. So again, taking a, a physical trading cards turning the NFTs makes a whole lot of sense. And the market drives the value of these cards and people buy, sell, and trade these cards. Yeah, this is all about scarcity. If in the smart contract, you know exactly how many of each individual player there are. And now the fact that they're digital opens up a whole new world of like interfaces that you can do to actually gamify this process now. So exactly like baseball cards, how there's very few limited supply, if you have a rare one, it's gonna be worth much more. So what I wanna say so far is what we're doing right now is we're taking things that like, I'll call them web two problems, right? Web or, or like the art provenance issue has been an issue for time immemorial. You know, like, was that really a Dali or a Rubens? You know, who, who actually painted that? Was it the guy or someone in his studio or some uh, fraudster? Um, blockchain is a phenomenal technology for establishing provenance. And as a result, uh, artists, uh, in part for the technology reasons, and also in part because artists are often at the cutting edge of new technologies, uh, jumped in. Then you'll see uh, an example of kind of very straightforward fashion brand commerce in the shoes. Uh, lots of other examples, uh, Dolce & Gabbana, pretty much any major luxury brand is playing in the space and some others as well. Very clear, like why? Because my daughter, uh, is spending all of her tuition, all of her allowances at nine years old on clothing and accessories in in Roblox. It's like there's a huge clothes like she spends more money on virtual clothes and real clothes for sure. Next is the baseball cards, right? God, like baseball cards, totally makes sense in an NFT space where the Ty Cobb you know, with the little like slightly, you know, or, or stamp collecting or, or like, you know, old timey coin collecting like my grandfather used to do. All of the collectibles make a ton of sense. And so the big NFLs and, and MLBs, Major League Baseballs are jumping in and saying, it, it's just obvious. This has been more or less obvious. This is not obvious what I'm about to show you. So Brett Malinowski, talk about the restaurant in Miami, Komodo. 
Yeah, so this was a really cool experience. This is more so kind of along the private membership club or exclusive access. And basically Komodo, they have this cool NFT. There's only about 300 of them total. And it's very simple. If you own this NFT, you get the right to order a special dessert. So it's not a free dessert, you just get to pay for it. And I actually went there, I experienced this, it's very cool. They basically bring out like six people are holding this huge Chinese dragon. It's a whole experience, they're playing music, everybody's looking at you. And then they bring this egg in that exact dragon bowl, pour some lava on it, the egg melts, and then it opens up ice cream. It's around $60, but it's just a cool experience that makes you feel a little bit special. And I just love seeing this being used in the real world. It's $60 to buy the dessert, yep. which is Miami standard. Yep. <laughs> that fabulous. But to have the right to buy the dessert, how much does that cost? That was $300 at the time of when I bought it. And I went again, and it went up to over $400. So it seems like more people are figuring it out, and the price of the NFT keeps increasing. And has Komodo made those unlimitedly available or are there drops? No, so that work? there's like, only a thousand of them, if I believe so. And they, but they actually get a 10% royalty on every sale. And so as that price increases, as more transactions go through, they're making 40 bucks, 50 bucks every time there's a sale. Komodo makes a 10% royalty? Exactly. Who's making the 90%? Uh, the, the owner of the NFT. So they partner. so explain this a little bit. So did they okay. like partner with someone? No, so it, these NFTs are decentralized. You own the pass, right? And I just go to the restaurant and say, hey, I have this NFT. I'd like to order the dessert. They say, great. But say I, I'm from out of town. I don't live in Miami. I'm only going to do this once every three months. So I can actually, once I leave, sell the NFT to get my investment back out. So I paid $300 for it. Then by the time I was ready to sell it, it went up to 400. I basically got 90% of that $400. So as like the Kim, Kim might want to buy it. And exactly. go for this NFT. I, I think you're exactly. getting excited. All right. Well, Kim, this is a good one. Why don't we talk about what are the what are the legal issues? Okay, let me back up a sec. If you're a restaurant or if you are a business that provides a luxury item or an exclusive experience, you should really be paying attention to this example. This is like next level of membership has its privileges, right? And it's a much more democratic exclusivity, I think, than, you know, the $50,000 entry fee for the Indian Creek Golf Club or mm -hmm. the $250,000 Lagos Golf Club membership. So, uh, uh, Kim, what, do you, what is your lawyer uh, radar? Is it beeping right here? What do you think? So these are, I mean, this is a very prevalent model. A lot of people are doing this, offering NFTs for exclusive access to whatever it might be. Um, and that in and of itself doesn't really raise a lot of legal issues, though, of course, the devil is in the details, right? Um, so, you know, just offering someone an exclusive access to an experience, that that doesn't really raise any legal concerns or no obvious ones. Um, you know, what can get tricky and what hasn't really been opined on by any of the regulators is this concept of like Komodo getting this royalty, right? So they're getting a percentage. So like a commission or a transaction based compensation, which is kind of a big um, problem in securities in the securities world. Um, every time someone on the secondary market, you know, not the primary purchaser, but someone down the road that's buying this, you know, the fact that they're getting a royalty back, you know, starts to look a little bit more like it could be a security um, and, and need to be registered. That being said, it hasn't been opined on. Um, I think most people take the view that perhaps those factors I mentioned in the first example are not all met. And so therefore, you know, we, um, I think most people are taking the position that it's not a security and they can do it. So again, it's, this is a very murky world um, for, for lawyers like me. Um, and, you know, we just have to look at everything on a facts and circumstances basis because depending on the, the more features, um, entrepreneurs like all of you want to add, um, some of those features can be helpful and some can can be more negatively affect our analysis. So we just have to look at everything and try, our job is to kind of figure out how to build the right model that's gonna keep you um, in, the, in the clear. 
the way media law works, and this has been true for time immemorial, is new media technologies develop and they apply metaphors or they provide, um, they try to find like ways to use old technology descriptors to apply law that is sometimes decades old. So for instance, you know, uh, TV law started out as radio with images, you know, and so forth. And then eventually, like sometimes decades later, the regulations get caught up. So a great example of this is, I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Facebook is begging, or Meta now, is begging regulators to write new regulations. Um, their, one of their main lines in front of Congress is regulate us, please. Now, we can talk offline about whether I think that that's real or just PRBS, which is <laughs> what I think it is. But the bottom line is they're running massive ad campaigns begging regulators to regulate them. And, and if you look at public statements from Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, they're begging regulators to regulate them because what we're using in Web 2 hasn't even caught up to Web 2 and we're already into Web 3. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to take a minute and nerd it. Okay, this is the boring but important part of the conversation. So everybody bear with us. We have some really fun examples uh, coming up. But um, Kim Pryor, along with her partner, Daniel Stabile, have written one of the very first textbooks through University of Miami Law School Press on web, uh, on blockchain and, and Web3 law. And so you have been forced by that exercise to really do a very broad and comprehensive analysis of what case law there is available. And I'd like you to just start really at the 30,000 foot level. What did you guys find? Did you find that there's some really good applicable case law in some of these areas? Or did you find this is a complete wild west of the law? Mm -hmm. um, I think it depends on, on what point in history you want to talk about. Um, so the, the textbook we wrote, I was saying this before we started, we wrote the book starting in 2019. I think it was published in 2020. Uh, we're working on the second edition now because we found that it's it's very it's actually outdated at this point, right? There were there was no such thing as an NFT when we wrote the book, um, and there was no such thing as a stablecoin when we wrote the book, and um, and also the regulators have have you know done so much um, in that point, and you know to, but to answer your question, you're absolutely right that we're applying old laws, meaning like. 1930s laws, depression era laws, um, the Securities Act, the Securities Exchange Act, um, you know, Commodities Acts. I mean, they've been updated over time, but they're very old, antiquated. Uh, and, you know, we do have legislation pending, um, though it probably won't pass due to the midterm elections. But, but Congress has taken notice, right? There's many of these companies um, Coinbase and, and others that are paying our lobbyists a lot of money to go in and, and try to advocate for, for legislation, because you're right, not just, you know, in, in um, Facebook's case, but also the large um, crypto companies, they want, they want regulation or certainty, right? They want to understand what are the rules and tell us the rules and we'll play by them. And I think that is mostly what our clients say to us too. But in, when doing the textbook exercise, um, you know, we had to go back to some of these really old cases um, and the really old law, including the Howey case I mentioned from the 1950s, which is about the sale of orange groves in Florida, um, is a U.S. Supreme Court case, and the and the SEC uses that today um, as the standard for determining if any digital asset is a security. Um, now they've thrown in some curveballs and said, well, we're actually going to use some other tests too, um, just to, you know, keep it, keep it fun for you, I guess. Um, and, and including the Reeves test, which is what is traditionally applied for, for when, um, a note or like a loan is considered a security. So in cases, and there was a BlockFi case where, you know, some of these digital assets allow you to um, basically lend your tokens in order to have some sort of like governing power over a platform. We won't get into that, it's too complicated, but that the SEC said, well, well yeah. that's security too. So basically we, 
we do have to apply all these old rules. And then what we have going on now is we have the regulators coming in, usually acting by enforcement. So they're not going to come and tell you ahead of time, here's what we're thinking. We, we think that this is how you should apply it. They've done that in some cases, but largely to this day, they come in after the fact, say, we think what you did was wrong. You should have known it was wrong and you're gonna pay us hundreds of million dollars in fines for that. And, and we see that over and over and over again, not just with the SEC, but the CFTC and, and also FinCEN, who's our regulator that, that um, tries to prevent money laundering. Um, so this is kind of a theme. This is why everyone is very proactive in saying we want legislation, right? Because we don't want to have to pay fines for doing something that we thought was okay. And it turns out that now you've decided it's not okay. Yeah, that's great. So what I just think I heard you say is that they're using a securities law related to selling orange groves in the state of Florida as one of the legal bases for metaverse and Web3 legal decisions around securities. Is that correct? That's 100% correct. That's okay. the primary. So my, yep. Yeah. So, so that's where the law is, guys, right? <laughs> is we're, 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 you know, regulators are kind of doing their best to find, because, because ultimately the legislators are not doing their job arguably, which is making law because Congress is basically in deadlock. And so if you are a enforcer of securities law, you have to just draw from what's available and, and build analogies, right? And, and that's where lawyering comes in. I did want to ask you, um, what is the, what are the number, like one to three top use cases, uh, if you could quickly, that people come to you asking for help with just sure. really quick. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I think that, you know, a lot of token issuances or digital asset issuances, and that can mean I want to raise money by doing a token, or I have a platform and I want to use that token to pay for certain, like in the Web3 environment, right? If I, I have a Web3 in, platform and I want people to be able to use this token as currency within that platform. So, so, so a token is like a cryptocurrency that's usable within a specific uh, right. metaverse? Yeah, correct. So correct. So, Robux is a token. Yeah. Okay, keep going. And then and then NFTs. Um, those are very all very common um, questions, right? Pe developers saying, I want to issue this token for one or more purposes, or I want to issue multiple tokens for one or more purposes. And, and how do I do that in a legally compliant way? Yeah, uh, that that's one kind of bucket. Another. Yeah. So, bucket. so tokens and NFTs. So if you're interested in using tokens, which is basically like digital currency within your meta world, because there's real money that's buying it and being exchanged at the behind the scenes there, uh, you know, or NFTs. Um, how often does someone come to you with a token or crypto uh, or NFT question? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> um, I, I don't know that the answer is always, we don't know. I think that we will say um, it's not clear, but the conservative approach is right. as follows, right? So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's usually a business decision for the client. We'll give you the pros and cons. We'll give you the, the, right. your, the arguments in your favor. And at the end of the day, a lot of, you know, depending on who you are, where you are, I mean, you know, practically speaking, the SEC, the CFTC, they may not go after, you know, small business X, they're going after the really large companies, yeah. but it still doesn't mean there's no legal risk, right? So, so it, uh, it, I know you had some other examples, but before we get to that, but, this is definitely Brett Malinowski's world. So Brett, you've been on the other side of this conversation where the lawyer is pouring cold water telling you the risks, <laughs> telling you the worst case scenarios, and then your client is, we're doing this. So tell me about your perspective on what she's saying regarding legal uh, risk uh, for NFTs and tokens. Yeah. So we had to talk to probably three or four different lawyers. And the answer was, got very frustrating, was always the same. They never really knew. <laughs> like there's so, it was just so unclear. And so basically there's just loose guidelines that we had to follow as people who have sold NFTs for different communities, different projects, some of which are fundraising in a sense. And really it is, you can't prop, uh, you can't promise passive income or revenue. You can't promise that they're going to profit off the NFT from our team's work. And on top of that, you can't promise a token 
if you issue a token that's on chain where people provide liquidity, meaning, and these are a lot of big words, if you offer like a cryptocurrency uh, to your holders of your NFT with the expectation that they could then sell that currency for US dollars, then that's really tricky with that. So you have to, if you're going to implement a token, you really have to say that's like one token equals one token, kind of like a, a Chuck E. Cheese or like a, any one of these like just uh, entertainment ticket systems. And so it's just all about your language at the end of the day and when, how you're presenting it because it's such an uncharted territory. Yeah, so what I heard you say is you can't like promise uh, for an NFT or token to be like an annuity that will earn you a return. Uh, exactly. Yeah, so the, there's there are certain security laws. It gets confusing because the NFTs are scarce. And if there's more demand, the price is going to go up because there's only 10,000 of them. But if 100,000 people want them, the price of the access pass goes up, which is fine. But you can't promise that you're going to pay out profits from a business venture to the holders, if that makes sense. Okay. So I'm seeing a nod from Kim. So we're good there, right, Kim? He's accurate? Yeah. I mean, again... I highly advise that everyone, you know, seek legal counsel um, because it's the devil is certainly in the details. But Brett is generally correct because, again, on the Howey test, we want to look the the key factor the SEC is going to look at is from the efforts of others. So, right. So if there's any third party involvement that's allowing you to make that money. Um, or, or and more importantly, the issuer's involvement, the company that's issuing that NFT, if they're behind the scenes doing things to make it more valuable and you're relying on that to make money, then you're more likely to be a security. So th that's, I think, what Brett is getting at. Yeah, yeah so we'll, we'll lawyer that language before we send it out <laughs> at, at the end of the session. Is that okay, Kim? Can you take a look at what we, this is a good piece of a checklist item for what we want to send at the end, but we'll make sure to lawyer it so it's accurate. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, it, there's one tiny detail. Like an NFT is not a product in and of itself. It's just a technology to get access to a product. Very similar to like how you log into your LinkedIn where you put your username and password. An NFT would just replace that aspect. And so people like think that NFTs are like a thing when in reality is just a function of a business in a sense, function of the technology. Maybe I'm getting too complicated for people. <laughs> yeah, so that actually has marketing implications. So we'll yeah. talk about that in a second. But Kim, uh, just to close the loop with you, could you just really quickly run through a couple other, just very quickly, a sentence each, a couple other use cases that are coming to you? Because uh, I want to show a fun video. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of things that come to us are, especially in Miami, are like remittances. People like to use, you know, um, they, they want to help facilitate people sending money elsewhere, um, particularly in the form of, of like Bitcoin or Ether or something like that. That's a big use case here in Miami. I mean, with the, with the metaverse, you know, we haven't really, you know, gotten too much of that yet because it's still evolving. Right. Um, and there's, and it's very unclear kind of what the legal ramifications of the metaverse are until you like look at a particular use case, right? Um, so I'll let you go because I, I think I may have more comments as you get some of your examples. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to let you know in the chat, in the Q&A, uh, Ariel Biscayart asked two kind of more technical legal questions. Um, I'm going to let you answer those uh, by typing answers. Uh, but, you know, if, if it's up to you whether you want to dispense free legal mm -hmm. advice or however you want to handle those. But they're too granular for, for the general session. But I wanted to acknowledge Ariel's questions. Um, what I wanted to skip to, though, is, um, OK, so have, have any of you guys ever heard of Morgan and Morgan? Well, uh, oops, let me uh, I want to optimize this for video. So uh, all right, let's do that again. So Morgan and Morgan uh, are a uh, law firm, and they created a uh, really beautiful, uh, really fun video uh, talking about law in the meta verse. Uh, Brett Searcy, could you just give a quick, um, you know, this is showing a lot of different meta worlds. Like, what should people be watching for as they watch this in terms of just the the aesthetic and and the design and the and the and the approach? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a clever piece. I mean, is it is it uh, going to drive business? I don't know. But what it does communicate is that they know the space, right? 
And when you're watching this, you're going to see that the characters are in lots of different avatar formats. It's because they're in lots of different meta worlds, right? Mm -hmm. So the metaverse will ultimately be an interconnection of all of these different meta worlds, but you'll see that they're in some business ones, some gaming ones, they're in some high res ones, some low res ones. And it's, it's kind of a clever way to say that, like they know the space really well. Yeah, Brett, what I might actually do is I'll play it once, Brett Malinowski, I'll play it once and then maybe I'll quiz you as you just kind of go and see if you can identify the meta worlds. All right, so All right, see, if, see if you guys spot the meta worlds. Here we go. Whoops. There we go. I'm John Morgan of Morgan & Morgan. As millions flock to the metaverse, many are experiencing unnecessary pain and suffering, terrible car crashes, frightening trip and falls, and on-the-job injuries. Our army of over 800 attorneys and 4,000 support staff have recovered billions for clients just like you. Injured? Just dial pound law. That's all. Morgan & Morgan, America, and now the universe's largest injury law firm. I love that. I'm John Morgan. Okay, what's that? Brett Malinowski. Is this Roblox? No, this isn't Roblox. Morgan, I don't know Morgan this. Morgan & Morgan. As millions... That's Roblox. Yeah, that one is. <laughs> okay, so uh, anybody who knows what the first one is, put it in the chat. <laughs> Flock to the metaverse, many are experiencing unnecessary pain and suffering. Terrible car. That's still Roblox. Yeah. Crashes. Frightening. That's Fortnite. Trip and fall. That's easy. So that's Fortnite. And on the job in. That's Fortnite as well. Injuries. Our army of over. This is the same as the first one. Yeah, yeah. and it might be it might be custom business one that they're that they're using. Yeah, see, does anyone in the chat know what this is? For 800 attorneys and 4,000 support staff have recovered billions for clients just like you. Damn Injured? It might, it might even be a Roblox world, right? Because mm. Roblox has lots of different... Just dial pound law, that's all. Morgan & Morgan, America, and now the universe's largest injury law firm. All right. Um, did we figure out where that last one was? Or I heard Brett Searcy, you said it might be like a... They might have found a business one. There are a lot out there. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So the point is, guys, that, you know, um, even law firms, right, are making, uh, branding themselves as the law firm for the metaverse. Now, you know, <laughs> how does how does uh, trip and I think Morgan and Morgan's kind of like a personal injury firm. So how does how does trip and fall work in the metaverse? I, you know, there's an invention for everything, but but it is interesting to think about what personal injury could look like and mean in a meta world, right? Like, could it be someone stealing your virtual property or you know ripping off your uh, virtual hat, your virtual Nikes? Um, you know, my daughter has been defrauded. Uh, in the virtual world when somebody basically said, let's trade pets on adopt me and then didn't trade it back. Um, so um, she believes she's been hacked as well. And like her pet inventory has been taken. She is always talking about scamsters and fraudsters in the metaverse. And so, uh, you know, those are potentially personal injury claims, right, Kim Pryor? <laughs> I, I guess so. I mean, I think that it would <laughs> depends on the like what is your actual harm, right? I mean, did you actually suffer any physical losses or monetary losses? You know, when I think about the amount of time it took my daughter to get like a, a unicorn, what is it called, Brett, when you get like the unicorn and then the next level unicorn because you combine 16 in a what, do you remember what that's called? I'm not a Roblox guy. I'm a little too old for Roblox, but that's <laughs> a I've had this pain in different video games growing up. Like I spent hundreds of hours to earn these items and RuneScape was one of them that I used to play. And someone just like that would scam me and like trick me because I was like a 10 year old kid and I'd lost all my progress. And then I was heartbroken for weeks. Like I, yeah. I was traumatized. I remember when I got Metroid reset right before I won the whole game and I had to start over on the Nintendo. So, um, you know, you are what we call a digital native, which means that you grew up uh, with smartphones and, and the internet. Um, I wrote my first email, I'm 45 years old and wrote my first email in college. 
And so even though we're not that far in age, I mean, NFTs didn't exist in 2019 when the textbook on uh, that Kim and Daniel were writing was published. So th this world is moving really fast and th there's no way, you know, the financial and regulatory world can keep up. Um, but that doesn't mean there isn't a lot of money to be made. It's just um, business owners love uh, a reduced risk environment. Right. The number one thing that businesses want is to mitigate and plan for known risk. And, and I think what makes, uh, you know, at a high level, the financial and legal landscape of Web3 and the metaverse so challenging for businesses is it is a deeply uncertain market where you could do. So so you, you hire a guy like Brett Malinowski because he has the best checklist of what the best practices are. And then tomorrow, a regulator who had a fight with his uh, husband could call him and say, those practices are no longer okay. Have you ever had, Brett, um, can you tell us like the worst example of the downside and the risks of this Wild West, this uncertainty? I, I, I'd love to understand like what the financial cost has been to you or some of your clients, uh, not just in the drop in like the cryptocurrency value, Right, which is highly speculative, but actually following best best business practices, trying to do it right, and then getting slapped almost yeah. arbitrarily. I think the most frustrating part is it's so random on who gets hit. And so there was actually this crypto co uh, company that had an ICO in 2017, and last month the SEC came after them, and they did everything by the book on what you're supposed to do the right way, and just randomly got targeted by the SEC. And so it's more so just like it being picky and choosy and it being so, such a gray area that it really is like, you just have to like piss off the wrong person and they could kind of frame a story around how what you're doing is against the rules essentially. And so there's not, there's a lot of just little different various problems, but it's just very frustrating because there are a lot of people that are like egregiously just like scamming and like trying to get your wallet address, trying to get access to your wallet and steal money from you. But it seems like more resources go into finding people who are trying to do it the right way. And so it really just is kind of just don't piss off the wrong person. Don't make anybody come after you. In other words, there's a lot of discretion. Discretion. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we see this in all areas of law. This isn't unique, but the less well defined the area the more arbitrary the discretion can seem i think and this is this is the cold water of this space i think which is you have to be ready to have the arbitrary decisions derail the best laid plans and you have to price that risk into your investments and and you need a kim on your side to articulate what that worst case scenario can look like so that you can at least price the risk into your efforts. Because if all you're doing is to look for like rapacious, rapacious profiteering, you know, which is what frankly is a lot of what's going on in the space right now, um, you do expose yourself to a lot of risk and you could um, find uh, similar to the folks who've ridden the wave of cryptocurrency that all the money that you had on paper uh, has disappeared. Uh, and now you have that lease for that yellow Hummer uh, and uh, you can't afford it anymore. You know, a lot of paper millionaires made and lost uh, over the last couple of years in this space. Um, I want to kind of turn to some new cutting edge areas like where we've talked about where this was. Um, I want to uh, give one more example, um, which is the example of the... Um, Hang on. Or, or can I ask actually, so Brett, like what, what are some other cutting edge examples that are, are currently happening? Where do you see it going? And or like, what are you working on right now that, we, that we, we should know about? Yeah, yeah. So this is where, this is where Kim will actually have quite the task. So there's a lot of different uh, ways that we see like experimental business owners using. I, re I referenced the hotel version uh, to you guys before, where basically we have these things and these systems where you rent or you reserve a hotel room and you can reserve it for five nights, but maybe your trip gets cut short for like an emergency uh, medical reason or whatever. And so you're only able to stay three nights. Well, the, typically in today's day and age, you're kind of just screwed and you have to 
pay for all five nights that you reserved. And so if you were actually able to make hotel reservations in NFT, you would actually be able to own those nights in the hotel room, similar to owning like a ticket at a sporting event. And if you can't go to the sporting event, you could then resell the ticket. Well, you could kind of do that with hotel rooms if those reservations were as NFTs. Another one, Starbucks just actually launched their NFT uh, rewards program. So their loyalty rewards program at Starbucks is really cool. They have over, I think, 60 million people on it, and they were the one of the first to allow uh, mobile pay. So Starbucks has always been cutting edge. And if they actually implement NFTs into their loyalty rewards program, it, you, they can actually segment different targets of their customers. Like right now for Starbucks, it's you pay $5, you get five points. It's very linear, where if they actually implement NFTs, they can actually start doing different types of loyalty rewards for their higher end customers, people that are buying like their second, third, fourth product lines. And then also their baseline, they can kind of encourage people to be educated because if you like go through a 10 minute course, you can give them an NFT to commemorate that they went through that, and then you can give them rewards with that. And so it really just democratizes and segments stuff in a much more uh, specific and targeted way based on your customer base. So there's infinite possibilities, but those are the two right now that like really excite me. Those are cool. And but are you working on either of those, or uh, do you have? Something oh, so you're oh, I guess right mine. Now? I'm working on. Sorry, I think my biggest passion is education and information in the space, and so we're like one of the first projects to sell. Uh, education as an NFT. And so that way people can basically, they buy our NFT, that NFT gets them access to our course. They can take it, learn everything they need. And then once they're ready to actually, you know, practice what we teach, they can then sell the NFT to get their investment right back. And so it's just a much more fair way to present and sell information because it kind of holds us accountable since now there's a public floor price to our education. If what we're selling is completely useless, no one would buy it. The floor price would go to zero and the world would know where right now it's kind of just like a review system like Amazon. And if anyone has done Amazon, you know, it's pretty easy to buy reviews, have your friends make fake reviews and kind of deceive people where a floor price is much more, uh, much more hard to disguise, if that makes sense. Awesome. That's amazing. It's just a new way to sell access. Oh, damn. And damn yeah. Uh, Kim, any, any thoughts on some of those kind of cutting edge areas or even is there anything you can share without divulging any trade secrets and some of the stuff that you're seeing on the horizon and the financial and legal world? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, again, it, one of the best parts of this aspect of my job is getting to work with creative people like Brett um, and seeing, you know, their, their ideas. And, you know, we as lawyers want to do our best to not you know, squash that creativity or, or or try to harness it more than we have to. I mean, some interesting things that, you know, we have clients working on is just, you know, again, I think it's all framed similarly to what Brett's saying, which is like increasing access, right? Or making people's lives easier, um, including doing normal things like, you know, being able to, to you know, purchase a house or, or buy a car, you know, using your um, digital assets as collateral as opposed to traditional things. And, and, um, but it, as part of that, like doing it in a very unique way um, and partnering with some or with some prominent companies out there to create solutions. I know I'm being very vague, but I don't want to give away any secrets. Um, you know, and also I, I think, you know, we have clients that are doing very, not similar to what Brett's doing exactly, but again, just increasing access and education, trying to bring investments like real estate and things like that to more of the, the retail investor, right? Um, allowing people to, and, and these are more like securities, but the client knows that, right? Which is allowing, you know, anybody, you know, why do we have to have accredited investors? You can have very, very smart people that don't make $200,000 a year that know exactly what they're doing. Why can't they invest in something very basic, right? Um, or, or not basic, but something that they understand. Um, so people are trying to create access to, you know, investment opportunities and platforms to, you know, a broader range of people. Real estate syndicates are getting really popular where people yeah. can have like 100 NFTs. If you have one of these NFTs, you all can invest into like a group fund. Yeah, yeah. So um, I wanted to actually share what one of our clients is doing kind of another kind of cutting edge um, kind of application. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen really quick. Um, 
So at, at the beginning, I mentioned B BizHack is a fractional CMO services company. We, we come in and act as part-time heads of marketing for a variety of different companies. And one of the companies where we serve this role is called Grape Stars. Grape Stars is, uh, aspires to be the, the Amazon uh, of celebrity products. So the idea is that there has been a huge growth in celebrity-based products, uh, including celebrity wines, which is where Grape Stars got its start. But they're recognizing at Grape Stars that there's a huge desire in Web3 for communities built around affinities and shared interests. And celebrities are a natural organizer of those affinity groups. And so the idea is that, yes, we can do products, right, like wines, celebrity wines, celebrity NFTs, but we can also do celebrity services so we can help celebrities monetize their community in Web3 through a variety of different Web3 and metaverse products and experiences like concerts. So that's the idea is uh, similar that Amazon sells products, it offers web services through AWS, and it creates experiences like it's... Um, you know, Amazon Prime video service. Um, and this is not new. Uh, we love the example of Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg started back in 2004 as a gangster rapper uh, and, you know, released a DVD uh, in the, you know, old world. And in 2020, launched Snoop Wines, you know, and in, along with um, Martha Stewart, who has uh, another wine, and they were part of the movement in the early 2020s of celebrity wine, uh, celebrity associated wines. Next, he has his own line of cannabis, kind of anticipating, right, like very close to his uh, brand, but also uh, aligning himself with a business opportunity that's really emerging as cannabis becomes legal in more places. And he created Snoop Chef, right? So this guy, who started out as a gangster rapper in the early uh, 2000s has now grown into a variety of celebrity products around wine, cannabis, and food. But he did not stop there. Two years later, there's the Snoop NFT drop, and Snoop has also sold land adjacent to his Snoop Metaverse uh, mansion in the Metaverse. Uh, and so people want to live next door to Snoop in the metaverse. So this is a beautiful example of one of the most cutting edge marketing um, celebrities who is leveraging the new and emerging opportunities, both in the commerce world, uh, the marketing world, the branding world, and obviously also the metaverse and NFTs to monetize his brand. You know, Brett Malinowski, talk to me about uh, to me, the fundamental unit of value in the metaverse is a community of followers. And I want to just, you know, you are a celebrity in that space. And so I want you to talk, you know, with, with uh, hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter and YouTube. And so talk about what it's like to be a celebrity in the metaverse and how you're able to, to monetize that and how you see examples, pioneers like, like uh, Snoop Dogg. Yeah, so we call this like an ecosystem around the influencer or the person. And we've helped a lot of celebrities do this for themselves as well. And it's really cool because back in the day, it was always the distributors or the TV providers who had all the power or Hollywood who had the celebrities access and they were the ones funding all of this. But now in this Web2 creator economy where these people are building huge audiences off of TikTok and YouTube, that's a direct customer base. The people that really just want to support the creator. And so for me, I made my, I grew my following helping people learn how to trade NFTs. And a lot of people made money doing that. And so they felt like they owed me in a way and they wanted to reciprocate that value. And so when I actually ended up coming out with my first project, they ended up supporting it very heavily and being a big part of that. And so these creator economies, what Web3 changes is instead of the platform owning your audience, you can actually have a direct relationship with your audience and your community through a Discord server and through an NFT to get access. And so if they buy the NFT, 
they get private access to me, my knowledge, and to have conversations every single day. And that's really powerful because you're just creating a much more deep relationship. And now you can directly market to them whatever your product line is. And so Snoop Dogg is the perfect example of people like Snoop Dogg for 20 different reasons, but they're going to like his wine. They're going to like his whatever, his metaverse house. They're going to like his merch. And so you can just create these whole different verticals off your personal line because you own your audience in a sense, instead of the platform owning your audience. Yeah, let's let's dig into that. Owning your audience. This is the key differentiator between Web 2 and Web 3. Mm -hmm. The reason why when you find your audience and communicate to your audience through your Facebook business page, mm -hmm. right? Or your Instagram following mm -hmm. or your TikTok or mm -hmm. your LinkedIn, you are being, basically you are going through a third party, which is Meta or LinkedIn, mm -hmm. which is owned by Microsoft. Your, they own those relationships. Another great example of this is Amazon. When you buy, when you sell products through Amazon, Amazon owns the relationship with the customer, mm -hmm. not you. Mm -hmm. So the idea of Web3 is disintermediation. Get that middleman out mm -hmm. and let you have a more direct relationship and monetization of it. The other thing it does is it empowers your fans to monetize you. Mm -hmm. So talk about that. Like that's the flip side of this, which is, you know, we've always had fan clubs mm -hmm. where there's some person in, in Poughkeepsie who has the Taylor Swift fan club and gets all the girls all riled up so that when Taylor Swift comes to town, you know, they get to like see the concert and get backstage passes. But now that girl, that fan club of Taylor Swift can monetize, maybe even partner with Taylor, get a mm -hmm. license and make a ton of money together. So talk a little bit about how the, the balance of power shifts, not only to the creator and the celebrity, but also to their fans. Yeah, so the key distinction is if you're on YouTube, right, you let them run ads on your platform, but you don't choose what ads they run and they're taking 80% of that ad revenue and just giving you a small piece. And so you can just transfer your audience over to your own platform. And the cool thing about this, onto your point about like kind of like IP rights, is we're seeing this with Board Ape Yacht Club. If you actually own a Board Ape Yacht Club, you own the IP of that and people are putting that on their beer cans or we have like ape water coming out. We saw a big brand in Miami, Full Send, make Happy Dad with apes on it. And because it has that IP, it's doing really well. And so this is really cool because you can have your own website, your own platform, sell an NFT. The NFT gets you access to that platform. And now if you are an NFT holder, you could get the rights from Taylor Swift to sell her merch or to sell her likeness if she so pleases. And so it's just putting everything on your own platform and then actually giving your audience the right to own your platform as well. And so it's just a very intimate relationship that you can create with your audience. And it really speaks to a level of collaboration mm -hmm. that is more- it Aligns incentives. Potential. It aligns the incentives of both your audience and your brand. So if you are able to create a brand where you have a million little micro entrepreneurs monetizing mm -hmm. your brand and sharing with you in the profits through licensing, that is a really exciting opportunity. Now, tell me, Kim Pryor, uh, who's going to sue me? What SEC <laughs> official is going to knock on my door and why I'm going to get arrested for doing that? I'm sorry, for what, for which part? <laughs> Let's say I'm Taylor. No, you're Taylor yeah. Swift. Uh -huh. uh, Brett, Brett's Taylor Swift. I, 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 really I like that Taylor better. Swift <laughs> I'm a huge Swifty. I love her. My daughter loves her. I went to the concert. So let's say I'm, uh, Brett is Taylor Swift and I am dads for Swifties, right? So I love, and I create the dads for Swifties uh, metaverse. I create you know, a whole brand of Dad for Swifties apparel, all with the with the with the uh, imprimatur and the OK from Swift Enterprises. OK, so my question to you is like it, what 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 are the perils and risks for dads for Swifties in a <laughs> scenario like that where you're the fan boy who's mm -hmm. monetizing a celebrity brand with their permission? Yeah, I mean, as long as you have their permission, um, then you should be okay from an intellectual property perspective. I mean, that would need to be pursuant to a, like a formal licensing agreement, and you need to make sure that you're within the parameters of that licensing agreement, um, and that you're not giving anyone else permission to do things that are outside of the scope of that licensing agreement. That that's kind of the basic part on the IP side. Um, you know, from, you know, you also, one thing I didn't have it mentioned before, but we need to keep in mind is like privacy rights too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when in, in all of these cases, you need to make sure that if you're getting, you know, 
particularly if you're getting any sort of payment information or any like social security number, anything that's like personally identifiable information, you need to comply with the privacy laws. So that's something as well you need to keep in mind is making sure that you have adequate protections of the information that you're getting from people when you're setting up, you know, any sort of business, but in particular, like a platform like this um, and making sure it's not being shared without people's permission, et cetera. Um, you know, from a securities perspective, again, would depend really on like what benefits are you providing to people? Um, and, you know, is there anything that, you know, for instance, if you want to have a token within this place where people can, you know, buy and sell things and, you know, they have to buy the token and the token is tradable on the secondary market for more than people pay, you know, those are things that then you look at and you say, okay, is that token a security? But just doing the platform itself and it's just meant to exchange ideas, talk amongst, you know, you know, talk about the latest concerts, um, you know, her Oscar nomination, whatever it might be, um, that's probably not going to be a problem from security's perspective. Great. And selling the NFT would be like the license to have the right IP rights to sell likeness. The NF owning the NFT gives you that right automatically. That's kind of how people are using it right now. So if you bought an NFT from the originator, that is implies a kind of permission to then resell it. Permission. Yeah, like if Spider-Man, if Marvel or whoever it was made a, an NFT, they could sell that NFT and now you have, if they say so, you have the IP rights to license out and sell the likeness of Spider-Man or whoever it may be. Well, and to that point, it's very important when you're going to buy an NFT to read those terms and it's super very, important. very carefully. Yeah. Right. I mean, people, I think there's an example of like someone buying a book, right? Um, in the book, they thought they were buying like the rights to the book itself, but they were just buying like the book for like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um so, you know, you have to make sure you're really reading the terms and conditions to know exactly what it is you're buying and making sure you are buying that license, right? And that you're not just buying, you know, a copy that you can't. Right. You're, you're not you're not buying the Harry Potter series television rights. You're just buying a physical copy of the book that you can get for 30 bucks at Barnes and Noble. Right. right. And, <laughs> and if you're not careful, you could waste a lot of money on that. D do you feel like. Um, uh, is there is there is there a way, Kim, for folks who are really interested in this space, like Ariel Biscayart, who's kind of blowing up with questions? By the way, there's a question for you, Brett Nowanowski, uh, in there for you from her. Um, is is there are there resources that you would recommend that are are trusted and reliable, but also kind of cutting edge and up to date that you yeah. follow for the legal and financial stuff that you would recommend that we yeah. follow too? Yeah, I mean, for me, I rely on CoinDesk a lot. Um, so I just Coindesk. go into CoinDesk and you can set up your preferences for all kinds of alerts. I have a lot for legal and regulatory developments. I probably, and as well as market developments. So, you know, I get five or six emails from them a day, but um, I do find that they are like very on top of um, legal developments, including enforcement actions. Um, they're pretty, you know, they're pretty, you know, intelligent coverage. Um, my other recommendation, which I mentioned to someone was, I'm a member of the Digital Chamber of Commerce, um, as well as I know a number of people are, I think you have to be a member, but if you want to be really involved or even be active as, or just want to know about what's going on in Washington, um, if you want to be kind of on the cutting edge and understand what's going on behind the scenes, I think they're the most plugged in of anyone I've seen um, as far as kind of being able to, read the tea leaves as far as where things are going. Okay, um, so the journalism kind of media organization, you have Coindesk and yeah. then the Digital Chamber of Commerce. Yep. You know, and notice that these are, two, you know, she didn't say the Wall Street Journal and she didn't say the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. These are opportunities. These are new organizations and institutions and media outlets that are emerging to serve this need. And, you know, the Wall Street Journals and the U.S. Chambers should be paying attention and doing it themselves. They're better resourced. They're just slower to act. Brett, what about you? Who are you? The, you know, we, a lot of people follow you and we strongly encourage you to follow Brett. Uh, Brett Malinowski, he's got great um, credibility and, and integrity that he brings to this space. Who do you follow for, for, for who are your Bretts? Yeah, so it's pretty interesting to see. There's a guy named Zinica that I used to follow a lot. Um, Kobe, Crypto Kobe is his name. And these are a lot of anonymous people who you really don't even know who their real names are. Um, 
I guess JRNY Crypto, LEO Trades are cool people. I really like YouTubers because that's how I learn. So yeah, I'd say LEO Trades, JRNY Crypto, uh, and Zeneca, probably my top three. That's Z-E-N-E-C-A. Perfect. If you could just throw those in the chat to everybody, because yep. I couldn't quite make those out. Maybe it's my okay. old years. Um, but I think part of the point here, and, and part of what makes this really exciting is like, NFTs were invented essentially when COVIDs came around, you know, like as long as there's been COVID, there's been NFTs and, uh, or at least the kind of boom of them, which is just to say they're really recent. And so, you know, to be, uh, become a Brett is within reach for many of us, if you put the time in and you're also a little lucky. And so, um, you know, Brett, any, anything that you wanted to share just about this journey uh, as a young man, um, kind of at the beginning, you know, of your professional career uh, of going and, and, and gaining some prominence and, and being able to build uh, a career? I'm curious. I'm also super curious what your parents have to say about it all. <laughs> my dad's an entrepreneur, so I've kind of had a great mentor my whole life. But yeah, a year ago, I had zero followers. Like I had a few hundred from my high school on all social media platforms less than a year ago. And since joining the NFT space, I got 132,000 subscribers on YouTube. I got I hit 100K in the first six months. And then my Twitter's about 200,000 followers as well. And that did come from a deep understanding of crypto. I've been in the crypto space since 2014. I've understood blockchain as second nature for me and my friends. And so I definitely benefited from that. But I think it's just like a right time, right place, right skill set, right knowledge. And it's just provide value for free, like give people, teach them for free and see what comes from it. And they're going to bring that right back to you. So that's kind of been my philosophy. But this is single handedly, in my opinion, the biggest opportunity for anyone in our generation uh, since the Internet. And since it's really just democratizing ownership, I don't think there's any other place I'd rather be working. And I'm grateful to be in the position I am. But I think uh, we have some pretty cool ideas and I'm excited to see these all come to life. I it's not it. popular right now. People still think I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, awesome. I, I think I'm crazy for not, you know, <laughs> jumping on your bandwagon. That's the truth. Um, <laughs> let, let's, I want to do a quick diversity and inclusion lens on this. Um, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So, um, you know, we were sponsored by the Office of the Mayor's Diversity and Inclusion, uh, Equity and Inclusion Office. And we've been very conscientious about bringing on um a diverse set of guests, including age, you know, backgrounds, genders, and so forth. Um, there almost feels to me like there might be a reverse age bias in this space, like anyone, you know, don't trust anyone who's over 30 kind of thing. Um, and I'm so curious, I'm kind of curious about that, Brett, like, do you feel like your youth in the end is actually an advantage in this space? 100%. There's a, there's a big advantage because we understand digital, how digital ownership is important and status because we've been spending thousands of dollars in these video games our whole life. And that's been a core proponent of our life. So understanding that at a fundamental level and living it your whole childhood as your brain's developing just is a huge advantage in and of itself. Me and my friends, we don't even use PayPal, Cash App, Venmo anymore. We just send us the Ethereum address. If you ask me to send a bank wire, I get really scared and confused. And it's like, seems like such a big process. Like I have to find eight different lines of information, account number, transfer number, it scares me. Just send me the Ethereum address. It's open 24 seven, it'll go through today. So I think it's just second nature to us at this point. And then Kim, you know, this is technology in general is a space dominated uh, by men. Uh, maybe even we could call them tech bros. <laughs> um, and so I'm wondering, you know, as a woman in this space, how you've experienced um, some of the, you know, gender bias that lives in a lot of cutting edge technology spaces. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, unfortunately it does exist sometimes um, and this industry isn't really an exception. I mean, that being said, I mean, I do think that there's, you know, I have a lot of female colleagues in this area um, of all ages, um, young and older, um, as well as, um, you know, there's a, a lot of female entrepreneurs out there and developers, and um, there's a lot of networks, in, in fact, even in Miami of like female, um, you know, or, you know, women that want to be involved in, in blockchain or crypto or, you know, Web3, any of it. So, you know, I encourage everyone to, you know, get involved in those, you know, organizations, um, you know, if you want to be around, you know, like-minded people and, um, and, also, you know, but what I do find about what I really like about 
the digital asset space, and it's been that way for a long time, is the really like one of the um, primary drivers of it has always been like inclusivity, right? And, and opening exactly. and, and having it available to everyone. Like one of the best use cases of the cryptocurrency is like providing access to money really to currency for people that otherwise couldn't like you know people in the in the middle east like women in the middle east that aren't allowed to have a bank account right um it, they there's like a whole like underground banking system through bitcoin that these women use and so i think that because of that that being like one of the foundations of um of blockchain in general uh, has really opened the door for for that inclusivity of all people Anonymity yeah. and digital identity are like a huge thing where most people yeah. I interact with have like an animated profile picture and that's their digital identity. I don't know what they look like. Right. And that's like a core principle of Web3. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a fantastic, fantastic segue to our next week's guest. Brett, um, go ahead and talk about what uh, Angela is going to be sharing with us when it comes to recruitment yeah. in the metaverse. You want to bring up, can you bring up that last? Yeah, I'm doing uh, it right now. Uh, yeah, Brett, you just queued us up with a nice little softball there because um, we're very excited that uh, next week, Angela Anthony is going to be talking uh, from Scoutable is going to be talking about um, basically um, creating, um, you know, basically pro personality profiles that people can use for recruitment purposes. And what she's actually doing is letting people create avatars and then do their interviews using avatars so they can create a, a, a personification of themselves. And when those interviewers are occurring with businesses, all of the, you know, immediate, uh, you know, uh, things that happen in the first six seconds of an interview, when you get that perception of someone um, goes away and it, and it really eliminates, you know, all bias in the interview because you're interviewing an avatar, so to speak. Uh, plus, she also is using the metaverse to um, help people find, uh, identify skill sets. Uh, it's truly fascinating. I'm very excited to have her uh, next week um, as as our guest. And you'll be one of our guests as well. You want to just give a quick preview of what you'll talk sure. about? Sure, absolutely. So she's going to be covering like, um, you know, digital resumes and, cre and creating skill sets and in the interview and recruitment process. I'm going to then cover a little bit more of the the culture, the, the employee retention process, and maybe some training. Um, when COVID hit in 2020, we issued VR headsets to everybody at Starmark uh, so that we could continue to have uh, company meetings. We do agile retros every two weeks, which is a, a very big cultural thing that we used to do in our office at our bar every Friday afternoon, every other Friday afternoon. That all went away when COVID hit, but we were able to kind of recreate that in VR. And so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about more about how to use it from an internal perspective for an employee. She'll be talking about more recruitment. We'll be talking about engagement and retention. And, you know, this is a business imperative for Brett because a lot of the, uh, just like my clients are entering in the NFT space and the metaverse space, so are his. And so by getting his uh, employees comfortable of interacting in the metaverse, they're going to be better at able and better able to serve marketing needs for their clients. And then the week after that, we're going to have some great case studies. If anybody who's here today want, thinks they know a good case study or potentially could give a case study for that last session, we welcome your, uh, you know, uh, recommendations, uh, you can go ahead and email uh, us uh, or uh, put that in the chat. Um, I did want to yeah. remind you guys that uh, the recordings of these sessions will be on BizHack and Starmark's YouTube channels. At the end, you'll get some legal advice, uh, such as it is uh, uh, that's been lawyered. Uh, in terms of some things that you can uh, do and can't do. Uh, you'll also automatically be enrolled in the upcoming masterclass sessions, the two that we just mentioned. We do, uh, this is open and free to everyone. And so we do want you to invite your friends. Finally, I just wanna say, you know, very sincere thank you to the two Bretts and to Kim uh, and uh, really appreciate your expertise. You're playing ball with us and having fun with us. We really appreciate the extra time you've given as well, these extra 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, your time is valuable and we, uh, we are uh, very happy to, to work with you guys on this. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Awesome. Thank you, appreciate you having us. Thank, thank you. All right. Take care, everybody.